morning and welcome to Tuesdays with the Pilgrim. We continue our journey with the Great Heart, Christiana, and the boys with Chapter 35, Part 1, On Enchanted Ground. By this time they had come to the enchanted ground, where the air naturally caused one to become drowsy. It was all overgrown with briars and thorns, except for for where there were enchanted arbors scattered here and there. Some say that if anyone sits down or stretches out to get some sleep in one of these arbors, there is a strong chance that he will never get up or awaken in this world again. For this reason they went across the ground staying very near to one another. Greatheart went first because he was the guide, and Valiant for Truth pulled up the rear, fearing that some fiend, dragon, giant, or thief might possibly come and attack them from behind. So they went on, each with his sword drawn, and ready in his hands, for they knew that this was a dangerous place. They tried to be as encouraging as they could. Greatheart told Feeblemind to follow right behind him, and despondency was kept close to Valiant for truth. Now they had not gone far when a very heavy mist, along with a thick blackness, fell upon them. For a while they could barely see the person standing right next to them. Because of this they were forced for some time to feel for one another by listening to each other speak, for they walked not by sight. It would be obvious to anyone that this was tough going even for the best of them. How much worse, however, for the women and children and those who had tender feet and hearts. Nevertheless, moved along by the encouraging words of the one who was in the lead, and the one who guarded the rear, they managed to move on at a reasonable pace. The way was muddy in this place, and traveling through the mud was very tiring, and in all this area there was not so much as one inn or place to buy food whereby the weaker ones could be refreshed. So along they went, grunting and puffing and sighing, and as one would trip over a bush, another would get stuck in the mud. Some of the children even lost their shoes in the mud. One would cry out, I have fallen down. Another, Hey, where are you? And a third, The bushes have caught a hold of me, and I don't think I can get away from them. Finally, they were able to come to a warm arbor that offered rest and refreshment to the pilgrims. It was finely fashioned above them, and was beautified with greenery and furnished with benches and armchairs. There was also a soft couch upon which the weary could sit and rest. I am sure you know, all things considered, that this was quite tempting, for the pilgrims were already beginning to feel frustrated and defeated by the terrible condition of the way. In spite of this, not one of them expressed so much as a gesture or word to stop there. Indeed, as far as I could tell, they carefully gave heed to all of their guide's advice. He had so faithfully warned them about all the hazards and of the dangers associated with each of the hazards that they reached, that usually when they approached them, they roused their spirits and encouraged one another to deny the flesh. This arbor was called the Slothful's Friend, and its purpose was to allure, if possible, some of the pilgrims into resting there when they became weary. Chapter 35, Part 2 Greatheart's map. Then I saw in my dream that they went on in this solitary place until they came to a spot where one can easily lose his way. Now when it was light, their guide could readily tell them how to avoid the routes that would send them the wrong way. But in this darkness and mist, he was forced to come to a standstill. He had a map in his pocket, however, that showed all the ways that led to or from the celestial city. So he struck a match, for he would never went anywhere without them, and began to study his map. It instructed him to be careful to keep to the right side of the way in that area. If he had not taken time to look at his map, in all probability they would have drowned in the mud. For just in front of them, and ironically right where the way looked cleanest, there was a pit filled with mud. The pit was so deep that no one knew its depth and it was put there for the purpose of swallowing pilgrims and destroying them. Then I thought to myself, whoever goes on a pilgrimage must have one of these maps with him, so that he may look at it 
when he doesn't know which way to take. Chapter 35, Part 3, The Two Sleepers So they went on in this enchanted ground until they came to another arbor, which was built by the side of the highway. There in the arbor were two men who were fast asleep. Their names were Heedless and Too Bold. They had come a long way on their pilgrimage, but being weary from their journey, they had sat down to rest here and had fallen asleep. When the pilgrims saw them, they stood still, shaking their heads, for it was obvious to them that the sleepers were in a desperate plight. They discussed with one another what they should do, whether they should go on and leave them in their sleep, or to step over to them and try to wake them up. They decided to try to wake them, if possible, but with the understanding that they would be very careful themselves not to sit down or in any way seek to enjoy the benefits offered by the arbor. So they went in and spoke to the men, calling them by their names, for Greatheart seemed to know them, but they made no answer. Then Greatheart shook them and did whatever he could to disturb their sleep. Finally, one of them said, I will pay you when I get my money. When Greatheart heard this, he shook his head. Then the other one said, I will fight as long as I can hold my sword in my hand. At that, one of the children laughed. What does this mean? asked Christiana. They are talking in their sleep, Greatheart replied. No matter what you do to them, whether you strike them or beat them, they will answer you in this fashion. A long time ago, someone said to a drunkard, you will be like one sleeping on the high seas, lying on top of the rigging. They hit me, you will say, but I am not hurt. They beat me, but I don't feel it. When will I wake up so I can find another drink? This is what they are like. You know that when people talk in their sleep, they will say anything. These men speak incoherently now. Their words aren't directed by any faith or power or to reason. But this only reflects the condition they were in between the time they began their pilgrimage and when they sat down here. Here, then, is the trouble. When heedless ones go on a pilgrimage, the odds are better than twenty to one that this will be what happens to them, for this enchanted ground is one of the last refuges that the enemy to pilgrims has placed. You can see that it is almost at the end of the way. For this reason, it gives the enemy a greater advantage. He thinks, when will these fools have a stronger desire to sit down than when they are so very weary? And when will they be more likely to be weary than when they have almost reached their journey's end? So I say that this is the reason why the enchanted ground is placed so close to the land of Beulah, and so near the end of their race. May pilgrims always watch themselves carefully, so that what has happened to these men will never happen to them. For as you can see, no one can awaken these two. Chapter 35, Part 4. They are helped. Then the pilgrims, trembling with fear, desired to go on. They asked their guide to light a lantern so that they would have light on the rest of their way. So he lit the lantern, and they went on by its light, even though the darkness was still very great. The children by this time were miserably tired, and they cried out to him who loves pilgrims, asking him to make their way more comfortable. Shortly thereafter, when they had gone a little way further, a wind arose that drove the fog away so that the air became more clear. They were not yet off the enchanted ground, but at any rate they could see one another better. It was also easier to see the way that they should walk. Chapter 35, Part 5 They Meet Stanfast now when they had almost reached the end of this ground, they could hear just a little ahead of them the voice of someone who sounded deeply concerned. So they went on, trying to look ahead. Suddenly they saw a man on his knees with his hands and eyes lifted toward heaven. It appeared that he was speaking earnestly to the one who was above, but they were unable to hear what he was saying. They approached him very quietly since they did not wish to disturb him. When he had finished talking, he got up and began to run towards the celestial city. Then Greatheart called after him, saying, Hello, friend! If you are on your way to the celestial city, as I think you are, let us enjoy your companionship. So the man stopped, and they approached him. As soon as Mr. Honest saw him, he said, 
I know this man. Who is he? asked Valiant for Truth. He comes from the area where I used to live. His name is Stanfast. He is certainly a very fine pilgrim. So they came together, and Stanfast said to Old Honest, Hello, Mr. Honest. Is that really you? Yes, just as sure as you are standing here, it is I. I am so glad I have found you on this road, said Stanfast. And I was so glad to see you, too, and on your knees, replied Mr. Honest. Stanfast blushed a little and asked, You saw me? Yes, I did, and the sight caused my heart to rejoice. Why, what did you think? asked Stanfast. Well, what else could I think? but that we had come upon an honest man on the road, and that, therefore, we would soon be able to enjoy his company. Well, if you thought correctly, how happy I am, but if I am not as I should be, I alone must bear responsibility for it. That is true, replied Mr. Honest, but your concern for yourself only confirms to me more than ever that things are right between the Prince of Pilgrims and your soul, for he says... Blessed is the man who always fears. Chapter 35, Part 6 The Danger of the Enchanted Ground But, brother, please tell us why you were on your knees, said Valiant for Truth. Did you need mercy to help you with a struggle, or what? Well, as you know, we are on the enchanted ground, and as I was journeying along, I was thinking about what a dangerous road this is, and about how so many who have come all this way on the pilgrimage have been stopped and destroyed when they got to this place. I was also thinking about the manner of death in which people are destroyed here. Those who die here do not die from any kind of violence. Their death is not grievous to them. For the one who falls away by going to sleep begins that journey with comfort and pleasure. Yes, they rest satisfied in obedience to the will of that disease. Did you see the two men asleep in the arbor? Mr. Honest interrupted. Yes, yes, I saw Heedless and Too Bold there, and for all I know, they will lie there until they rot. Chapter 35, Part 7 Stanfast's Struggle with Madam Deception. But allow me to go on with my story, said Stanfast. As I was thinking, someone approached me who was dressed in very pleasing attire. Though she was a little old, she presented herself to me and offered me three things, her body, her purse, and her bed. Now to tell you the truth, I was quite weary and very sleepy, not to mention the fact that I am as poor as a church mouse. She may have known that fact. Anyway, I resisted her over and over, but she just smiled and let my rebuffs pass right over her. Then I started getting angry, but that didn't matter to her at all. She just continued to proposition me. She told me that, if I would submit to her, she would make me great and happy, for she said, I am the mistress of the world, and men are made happy by me. Then I asked her her name, and she told me it was Madame Deception. This made me want to distance myself from her all the more, but she kept following me with her enticements. Finally, I fell on my knees, and with hands lifted up, I cried to him who had said that he would help me. Evidently, just as you were approaching, she went on her way. When I saw her leave, I continued to give thanks for this great deliverance. I know she didn't intend any good for me, but rather she wanted to stop me from going any further on my journey. Without a doubt, her intentions were bad, said Mr. Honest. But wait a minute. As you have talked about her, it occurs to me that I have either seen her or read some story about her. Perhaps you have done both, said Mr. Stanfast. Madam Deception, exclaimed Mr. Honest, is she a tall, attractive woman with somewhat of a swarthy complexion? Right you are. She is the one that matches that description. Does she speak very smoothly and give you a smile at the end of every sentence? You got it again. This is exactly what she does. Does she not keep a large purse at her side, with her hand in it, eagerly fingering her money like it was her heart's delight? Yes, that is so. You couldn't have described her better, even if she had been standing here all this time. Then, said Mr. Honest, the one who drew a picture of her was a good artist, and the one who wrote about her said the truth. 
Chapter 35, Part 8 This woman is a witch, said Greatheart, and it is because of her sorceries that this ground is enchanted. Whoever lays his head down in her lap might as well lay his head on the chopping block, and whoever gazes upon her beauty is counted as an enemy of God. She is the one who maintains those who are the enemies of pilgrims in their wealth and splendor. And she has brought many men off so that they turn from the pilgrim's life. She is quite a talker, and she and her daughters are always yapping at the heels of one pilgrim or another, constantly promoting and praising the virtues of this present life. She is bold and impudent, always ready to talk with any man she can find. She laughs poor pilgrims to shame, but highly commends the rich. If there is someone shrewd enough to gain wealth, she will brag about him from house to house. She loves parties and feasting, and is always at one banquet or another. She has passed it around in some places that she is a goddess, so there are some who worship her. She likes to entertain, and she has opened houses of gambling and corruption. She boasts that no one can throw a party like she can. She promises to use her powers to bless all those and their children who pledge to her their reverent love and loyalty. On a whim, she will toss gold out of her purse in some places and to some people as if they were mere sand. She loves to be sought after, spoken well of, and held close to the hearts of mankind. She never grows weary of showing her powers and merchandise, and she loves them most who think the most highly of her. She will promise crowns and kingdoms to those who will take her advice, yet she has put many on a leash of bondage and has brought ten thousand times more into hell. Oh, cried Stanfast, what mercy I received when I was able to resist her, for where might she have drawn me? Where, asked Greatheart? Only God knows, but one thing is certain, she would have drawn you into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. She is the one who turned Absalom against his father, and Jeroboam against his master. She also persuaded Judas to sell his own lord, and she prevailed with Demas for, to forsake the godly pilgrim's life. No one knows all of the mischief she works. She causes dissensions between leaders and those they govern, between parents and children, between neighbor and neighbor, between a man and his wife, between a man and himself, and between the flesh and the spirit. Therefore, Mr. Standfast, do like your name commands, so that you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand. This discussion brought about a mixture of joy and fear among the pilgrims, but eventually they burst into song, singing... What danger is the pilgrim in, so many are his foes. How many ways there are to sin, no living mortal knows. Some shy away from ditch, yet can lie wallowing in mire. Some, though they shun the frying pan, go leaping into the fire. And that ends chapter 35. We'll pick up next week with chapter 36, the final chapter of our pilgrim's journey. And until then, take care, stay safe, and God bless. Mm -hmm.